Welcome to the Dot 3D 5.0 for iOS LiDAR complete video tutorial. My name is Chris and I'll be your guide today as we walk through the full procedure of 3D scanning a scene, editing and processing in real time on your iOS LiDAR enabled device. That would be an iPad Pro 2020 and up or an iPhone Pro or Pro Max 12 or higher. Today we're going to be operating on an iPad Pro 2021 with our built-in LiDAR as you see here. This video will also apply to Windows and Android platforms for Dot3D once 5.0 has been released on those platforms in the near future. So without further ado, let's switch over to our iPad and start scanning an entire scene, in this case a simulated crime scene. Welcome to Dot3D Pro on my iPad Pro. So here you see your home screen by default. Anytime you open Dot3D, this is what we refer to as the gallery view, and it will be a place to view your previous scans, open them up, and edit them. And when you're ready to start your first scan, you simply press the new scan button in the top left of your screen. Now we are seeing what the iPad LiDAR camera sees, which is in this case a simulated crime scene. If you are scanning crime scenes, you're in the right place, but also FYI, this is just an example scan we happen to be using. If you're scanning houses, apartments, outdoor scenes, indoor scenes, ship compartments, mechanical rooms, really anything under the sun that you could be scanning, know that this tutorial still applies to you as well. You'll want to hold your device steady and point at some reasonable, recognizable geometry within range to choose a starting point for your scan. The green circle on the right is called the scene fitness bar and is an indicator of the geometry being recognized at any point in time, showing us that the corner of the room is a good place to start our scan. If you'd also like to add some light to a dimly lit scene, you can power on your built-in flashlight on the left. You'll see that I have set up some April tag targets. So these can be printed from dotproduct3d.com slash targets and are highly recommended but optional for use while scanning. I'm going to utilize the three targets that you see in the corner of the room here as my start and finish point for my scan, which will automatically accurately close the loop on those targets during optimization and behind the scenes improve the overall accuracy of your scan. We'll also be taking it to the next level when we reference known measurements between tags, which is even more optional, but also recommended because it can really guarantee your accuracy and add confidence, especially across larger scenes. So with that being said, let's start our scan by pressing the button on the right, and we are live. And you'll notice that these April tag targets turn orange automatically, indicating that they have been recognized by the software and will be taken into account during optimization. As I move through my scene, you can see the dense color point cloud being populated in real time, so you can see how well and what you've captured as you move through your scene. So if I notice the shadow behind the body here, I just move over and get it from a different angle, get a little bit closer and fill in all of the detail that I need. We've also built in a feature to allow you to trigger frames of capture manually whenever you want to add more detail when the software might not be populating those frames for you. So as I get in close to the gun here, I can tap anywhere on my screen that isn't a button to manually trigger a frame of capture when Dot3D isn't otherwise. And that added some more detail to that particular area of interest. And I'm going to go ahead and do the same thing over here on the piece of evidence near the wall. Just tap on my screen anywhere but the buttons, and it'll automatically trigger a frame of capture every time you do that. So it's a great way to fill in on challenging areas or something you've already captured, but want to make sure you add a little bit more dense detail on. So I'll do it a little bit more on the body here before I move on to other parts of my scene. And before I do move on, we have another important feature to demonstrate on these particular pieces of evidence. So below your start and stop scanning button, you have a photo icon, and this is going to allow you to access your high resolution tablet or phone camera to capture HD still frames of particularly important areas with a 3D viewpoint associated. So you can pull these frames up in high resolution from within your Dot3D scan after capture. To capture these, I'm simply tapping or holding on the camera icon so I can see as the image is captured. 
And this is just a preview. The actual images themselves are much higher resolution, same as you would get out of your camera app traditionally. And it can be useful for something as simple as legibility on text and an equipment tag, pieces of evidence as shown here, or larger scale photos that you would have been taking otherwise to have all stored within your compressed 3D file with that viewpoint information associated. Similar to the HD photo capture feature is the scan time annotation capability. So that same button, if you tap and hold on it, will allow you to then move from the photo button to the crosshair icon. And now I'm taking a scan time annotation, which also attaches a photograph. So that particular point in the green crosshair has now been added as an annotation with an attached photograph, and I'll be prompted to fill in details on that annotation after I finish my scan. So annotation is something you can do after the fact by just tapping points within your scan, but it's also something you can do while scanning. So anytime you have something you want to flag, you can utilize that crosshair icon to mark it. So as I move through my scene, I make sure I fill in this box from each corner. And you'll also notice that I am recognizing several other April tags in my scene while scanning. So the most commonly used and most important April tag workflow across the board is just those simple two to three at my start point. But it's good to have them scattered throughout your scene when possible. And in this case, to reference measurements, if you can spare the time or effort. Uh, so with the tape measure, I measured the length, width, and height of this room directly between pairs of April tags. And that's why you see a few more tags scattered throughout my scene. And we will apply that measurement before we optimize our data. So this is a really small example scan. Um, it's really important to note that especially with Dot 3D 5.0, you can do much, much, much larger scenes all in one go. Uh, we've rebuilt our engine from the ground up to enable very large scene capture and very fast optimization times. So don't feel like you're constrained to one, two rooms or anything along those lines. Uh, there's always going to be a practical limitation to, you know, what you want to use handheld 3D scanning for all alone, but entire residents, entire floors of buildings are all within the realm of DOT 3D now, as well as large outdoor environments. But for the sake of today's video, we're keeping it to a quick and easy single room scan. And we've pretty much captured the whole room at this point. And we're going to make sure we've gotten those HD evidence photographs, double check to make sure we haven't missed any particularly important areas and get ready to close out our scan. Before we do close out our scan, we can pause using the pause button on the bottom right. Now I'm no longer capturing, but I am still walking through my scene, both in reality and virtually to see if I missed anything. So if I notice, oh wait, I you know could have added a little bit more data on the floor here, I can still add that in. So I'm going to relocalize by holding my device still and press the play button where the pause button was in the bottom right. And now I am capturing again. Um, so you pause, you move around and you can continue, uh, which is a great feature to check your work before you finish your scan. So now I press the button on the right again to finish my scan and it processed immediately. So you see your preview in instantaneously. Uh, and this is a chance to take a look at what was captured um, and append if necessary. So this is not the final result. This is your unoptimized preview, which has already been auto-saved to the location on the bottom of the screen. But it is a chance to make sure you got everything you need. So I see that I didn't really get any data behind the table here. Let's say I really needed that and I want to go back and add it before moving on to the next step, which is optimization and targeting if applicable. So before I move forward, I'm going to go to scan slash append on the top left of my screen and append to this scan. Now I can choose a frame to reposition in. You have to pick a frame that nothing has changed in that looks like it has some reasonable geometry, such as a corner area, and that is relatively near the area that you want to add. So I get this ghosted view that I can line up with reality, then Dot3D remembers where it was, and I can move around and just build directly back into that same file on the fly. 
So a really, really powerful feature here in the append capability, especially with these really large scans that we're seeing now in DOT 3D 5.0. Nobody wants to get to the end of a 30 minute scan just to realize they missed a critically important area unless they have the ability to append. So you can always go add it right back in. As you see here, that behind the table area was seamlessly built right back into that larger scan on the fly. So now we're looking at our unoptimized preview again, and I think we're pretty happy with it. So if you weren't using any sort of advanced targeting workflows, the next step would be to go straight to the optimization button up top. But in this case, as mentioned, we do have some measurements that we want to apply. So if you have any reference constraints that you want applied to your data, you want to make sure that those are input before you optimize your scan. Reference constraints can include measurements from a tape measure or a laser disto like we're doing today, or known target coordinates from any trusted source, such as a total station, another laser scan, a CAD model, GPS points, drone data, etc. While adding reference constraints is certainly recommended and a great best practice, especially for large scenes or tight accuracy requirements, it is important to note that this is definitely optional and it is very much possible to get great results even without any references, especially for smaller area scans. But in this case where we do have our target to target measurements on hand, we definitely want to make sure that those are applied. So if you're referencing measurements or coordinates, you're going to go to the targeting tab before you optimize. So in this case, we're going to tap on targets. And we're just going to be putting in some measurements that we took across the length, width, and height of our room between three pairs of targets. So I press the reference distance button in the top left, and then I simply tap on target 17 and 23 to input the distance between those two tags as measured at 132 and 9 16 inches. And then do the same for each of the other two measurements in my scene at 63 and 13 sixteenths and 133 and a half accordingly. So now all three measurements have been input and I'm ready to move on to optimization. So I tap on the optimize button and this is a critically important step for virtually every scan. So everything we've been doing so far has been just a preview of the unoptimized data. So things look pretty great on this small scan, but in other situations, it's totally normal to see any sort of misalignment, drift, fuzziness, incorrect overlap uh, during the unoptimized preview. That's nothing to be worried about and is going to be filtered out automatically during optimization, especially when you're using best practices as outlined here today. So what's happening when you optimize your scan? The frame to frame alignment is being improved, improving the overall accuracy of your scan based on overlapping geometry, based on any targeting or other reference constraints that were implemented. Automatically, you're also going to see color leveling throughout your scene, as well as noise reduction and overall accuracy improvement across the board. So this is something you really want to take advantage of on any scan, but it doesn't have to be done right away. So everything is already auto saved in your original unoptimized format. So if you wanted to go capture a bunch of scans in the field and deal with the optimization later, you can always do that. However, in 5.0, our optimization is much, much, much faster, even for large scans. So a lot of times you may do it right away on your device, like we're going to do right now. So you'll typically leave all the boxes checked as they are by default, as DOT3D will automatically recognize if you've used April tags, if you've implemented any constraints, and check those boxes for you accordingly. So when you're ready, you press optimize and just let it crunch away. This will take anywhere from five to 10 seconds to five, 10, maybe a lot more if it's a really, really large scan uh, minutes, um, but it, it's a lot faster nowadays than it ever used to be in the past, that's for sure. And this is already finishing up on me right now in a total of just 25 seconds with no speed up for the video in this case whatsoever. So now we see the optimized data and everything just looks a little bit crisper, a little bit cleaner. So the colors have been cleaned up the edges, the corners, any sort of noise, fuzziness has been all filtered out and we're looking at our final results. Uh, you can zoom in on the density and the detail of the points at this stage and admire the dense and detailed measurable color 3D point cloud you've captured. In terms of looking at your data, you have a few options right on the screen here. So on the right side, we have what's called the surface mode that's toggled off right now. We're looking at the point cloud. You turn it on and you're looking at a surface-based rendering, so an image-based rendering of the scene. Now, if I zoom in, I'm not going to see that point cloud detail and density. Instead, I'm seeing this surface overlay. So personal preference, also depending on the scene, it can give a nice 
visual appearance to the scan, whereas the point cloud view is going to be more true to the data itself that's going to carry through into other applications from here. Below the surface toggle, we have the back faces toggle. So this is going to turn on and off the foreground of your scene. So when I turn it on, now I see my ceiling, my walls, every single point that was captured is now being shown on the screen. Whereas when you toggle that back off, then you can see through the foreground, which can be really helpful in interior situations like this. You'll also find some more scene settings in settings, scene rendering. So here you see I have my glow at one my point cloud transparency turned on, my classic point clouds turned off, and my normal base shading turned off. I recommend you play around with all these settings and just see what works for you. Uh, this is my default setup, but something else may be a little bit better for you. What you should not play around with, however, are the budgets. These are set to the ideal spec by default, and you should only be touching those if you're doing some sort of troubleshooting or something along those lines. Lastly, the far clip is something that you would adjust if you're dealing with very large scenes or if you're having any issues where when you zoom out you're not seeing all your data, that can be adjusted with the far clipping plane. So next we're going to cover setting our coordinate system. This is an important first step in most scenarios to set an origin or 0, 0, 0, or otherwise a known XYZ coordinate to reference your whole scene. So this will make sure your data comes in upright here or elsewhere and reference your entire scene for measurement, etc. So if I go to edit coordinates, I will see that I, for starters, have an auto set coordinate system floating in space, right where I started my scan from. Well, the Z axis is up, that's a good start. I oftentimes will want to set this somewhere on the ground plane, for example. So I'm going to go to set next to the user define button to set a new coordinate system. You can either set an origin, so a 0, 0, 0, or another known coordinate that you have, um, you know, from another data set, for example. If I'm just setting the origin, I tap pick origin. I zoom in to the point that I want to set. I tap and hold on the screen and I release when I'm happy with the point that I'm selecting. Then to set my Z axis straight up, I tap on the primary button and then hold on a large section of the floor plane to pull my Z axis perpendicularly out of the floor. And then I can do the same against the wall for my X axis. You can also toggle between X and Y to adjust as needed. But now, as you see, my coordinate system is properly set to the corner of the room. And then I just hit confirm in the top left to save that before closing out of the coordinate setting tab. So now that our coordinate system has been set, let's start measuring from our data. So I will go up to the measure tab and select distance and add measurement. And now you can tap and hold on anywhere on the screen to get this zoom window and then release to select the exact point you want to be measuring to and from. You can adjust your units down in the bottom right as well as view your delta x, delta y, and delta z based on that coordinate system that we just set. These points are totally adjustable by tapping and holding on the green circle. So you can really get precise with the points that you're picking to measure to and from. In addition to manually selected points, you can also measure to and from annotations or target center points in your scene. So let's go ahead and take a measurement from target 17 to target 23. And it's actually automatically recognizing the center point of each of those tags in this measurement. So this is a great way to confirm that your scale bar measurements were applied as intended. They should typically be within a millimeter or two of the reference measurements, so long as your measurements were accurate. Or to precisely capture an unmeasured distance by placing the target strategically in an area that you need to measure. You can take as many measurements as you want in .3D, and they all save directly into your DP file, and can be opened and viewed at any time in .3D here or elsewhere. Next, we're going to cover the Annotate tab. If you look closely up top, you'll see there's already a 1 next to the Annotate icon and a 3 next to Measure because we just took three measurements. The 1 next to Annotate is from the annotation that we made while scanning, so we're going to start by completing that and then add some more. So to complete the annotation that you see here on the screen with the photo attached to it, we press the Complete Unfinished button on the left side of the screen and then follow the prompts to fill in the relevant details. So the typical annotation classes you will choose from are a point or a photo. 
unless you've created custom classes of your own, which you can do from the settings tab. If you want to keep the photo that was captured, you want to use a photo annotation. If you just want to add a note to a particular point, then you use a point annotation. In this case, we've chosen a photo annotation to keep that photo attached. And then we can fill in information on each of the tabs as shown on the screen here. So I'm going to input a little bit more detail on this particular piece of evidence and fill in any relevant information for each of the tabs shown on the screen that are applicable to my scenario. And then press complete to finish that annotation. Now you see bar number 20 on my list, but I'm going to go ahead and add some more annotations manually to each important piece of evidence that I have tagged in my scene. So I'll zoom in on the gun here, press and hold and release, and now I can manually add either a point or a photo annotation, depending on if you also want to attach a photograph to your annotation. These photo attached annotations can be from any photograph. It doesn't have to be something that was captured from within Dot3D. It can be from a higher resolution separate camera even, as long as you bring it onto the same device. Speaking of photographs, let's also take a look at the high resolution imagery that was captured while scanning. So to view these photos, we go to View, High Res Photos, and if you tap on the image, then it will bring you to that viewpoint in 3D, whereas if you hold on the image, it'll bring up the high resolution 2D detail from the same perspective. So this is really helpful to get more detail on particularly important areas, or in this case, pieces of evidence. It can also be useful for something as simple as legibility on an equipment tag that you wouldn't have gotten out of the point cloud, or just capturing all the same photographs you would have been taking separately, but having them strategically stored and organized within a 3D file in a compressed format. With the additional benefit of these icons in your 3D scene showing the position and orientation of each photograph that was taken. Next, we're going to capture a quick screenshot by tapping the top right screenshot button, and it gives you several sharing options for a simple PNG file that's cleanly captured without the menu items involved. Now that covers the majority of the measurement, editing, and viewing capabilities here, so let's move on to save and export. So I'm going to press File, Save As, to save directly to the dot .product DP compressed point cloud format. It's recommended you always save to the DP format first, and stay in the DP format as long as you can, depending on the workflow. However, it's important to note that if you're going to be taking the data outside of DOT3D on iOS, you currently need to make sure to check the Use Compatibility mode, when saving or exporting to DP. This compatibility mode ensures compatibility with .3D on Windows and Android, as well as compatibility with third-party applications that are currently reading the DP format. In the future, this will no longer be the case, as our new DP format receives more updates across the board, but currently, the new format is only compatible on iOS, so if you're leaving the iOS platform, make sure to select compatibility mode. Then press OK, and then you can choose where you want to save to. If you're going to be transferring your data off of your tablet or phone onto a Windows computer using the iTunes method, it's important to note that you have to save to the root .3D folder. So just .3D and done. Next, you're going to be asked about your output transform. You'll see that it has automatically selected the user-defined XYZ output transform because of the coordinate system that we set earlier here in .3D. If you would use survey control targeting to reference known coordinates to targets in your scene, then you would select the control targets option. Most cases, it'll automatically select for you whatever makes the most sense, and then you press save scene. If you need to export to another point cloud format for third party compatibility, after you save the DP, you want to go to share slash export as other file. And here you'll see all the options at your disposal, which include PTS, PTX, PLY, PTG, LAS, LAZ, E57, as well as the DP compatibility option. So you can also get to that version of the DP file from the export tab. In this case, we're going to save to E57, maintain the user-defined coordinate system, and press export scene. Then you will get a window to select where you save that file to similar to what we just did for the save as workflow. And we'll save it into our .3D data folder, which is the default for most of your scans, FYI, in addition to the .3D autosave folder, where your scans are always backed up immediately after capture. If you ever need to revert back to the unoptimized form, you can always find them there. 
So before we finish up here, we should also touch base on some of the view options and other settings that you also have at your disposal here in Dot3D on the iPad. So you have access to some view settings from the top right as well as the bottom right of your screen. From the top right, we go to View, and then we see we can toggle between Perspective and Orthographic. So I'll make that switch now to Orthographic. Next, we have the Show Axes button, which will just turn on your red, green, blue, XYZ origin rendering, showing what we set earlier. Now, if I go to Vantage Points, Top, now we're looking straight down on that orthographic view of the floor plan. I can also switch to Vantage Point Side. And then from the bottom, you have these same options. So if I want to go to Vantage Point Top Down again, and then turn my orthographic view off. Now I see that perspective view of the same top-down angle. Lastly, let's take a look at a few of the settings available in Dot3D. First, we're going to go to Sensor slash Cameras, where you see your scan settings. For most iOS users, these settings should be left alone, but you can adjust your max depth, toggle the strong depth filtering, which really should be left on at all times, and toggle your April tag detection, which should also be left on, assuming you are using April tags as recommended. One setting here that you certainly are welcome to edit are the default units for your instance of Dot3D. Under more settings here, you have some more scan settings that should generally be left alone outside of a unique troubleshooting scenario. Now we'll go back to the main settings tab where you can see you have the scene rendering settings that were touched upon at the beginning of the video, photo and annotation settings, which include a couple of particular UI toggles you might want to play with, and more importantly, the ability to set up custom annotation classes. If you have specific types of annotations and fields that your users need to be filling out, you can completely customize that using the Setup Annotation Classes button here in the Photos and Annotations setting. Now, moving down the list, next we have Units slash More, where you can adjust your default units throughout the app, you can set your home folder to the root folder, which is recommended if you're transferring via USB slash iTunes. You can toggle your app analytics, your native file dialogs, which are recommended, and some screenshot settings, as well as some screen recording settings are all available here. And lastly, below the line here, we have three more important sections. Download April tags will take you right to our download page for printable April tags for use in your scans. Feedback slash help will give you options to get product support and or provide feedback on your experience. And about is an important tab where you enter or edit your license info if using a license provided off of the app store. And from the about.3D section, you can check your version number as well as view the EULA, OS licenses, and more. Thank you for viewing the complete Dot3D 5.0 for iOS LiDAR tutorial. For more information in a searchable regularly updated online database, please visit dotproduct3d.com slash knowledge base.